the fact that Google now has 11 or 12 chat apps, whatever it is, and teens are going to, flocking to Google Docs to chat is <laughs> a little bit amusing there. is episode 50 of season 2 of Bad Voltage and this is me Stuart Langridge and Jeremy Garcia and not John O'Bacon because he's terribly terribly unwell apparently yeah he seems to have gotten the uh, open source leadership summit plague or something yeah from the sound of it like you came away unwell he came away unwell I, I have to say I had um, dinner with my daughter last night and she said oh I'd seen on um, Facebook that John is not very well I assume it's man flu, and I'm like, no, he's dying. He's really seriously yeah, unwell. Yeah, no, he was, he was thoroughly unwell. Um, but before we did the Open Source Leadership Summit, we did something else, and I think that we should talk about that something else. What do you think? I totally agree with you. Let's do it. Uh, so Stuart was kind enough to, to fly over an ocean to join us in Pasadena for a little conference you may have heard of called SCALE, and uh, last year, he missed Scale. Scale has been a, a conference that John and I have attended for many, many years now. Great conference, uh, Southern California Area Linux Expo out there. And one of the reasons that Stuart made the trip, aside from it being a great show, is that we did another Bad Voltage Live. We did, and it was fab. Now, this is not that show, obviously. Um, it is not. <laughs> but we, we have now obtained various audio-visual recordings of the event. <laughs> <laughs> and our intrepid sound engineer, as soon as he climbs out of the plague pit, will be working on uh, putting those together, and we're going to put our live show, and we'll release it, uh, we'll have video and everything. And that's going to be the next show. But yes. we thought it might be worth giving you a little bit of a teaser about what we thought of how it went and what we thought of how scale went generally, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And we should take this time once again to thank uh, Scale for allowing us to do the show once again and our sponsor, System76 and, and Ticketmaster. I, th I personally think the show came out really well. I know I had a great time doing it, great time preparing for it. Don't want to give away too much, but is there one bit you personally liked and think that it wouldn't be too much of a spoiler giving away right now? Ooh, now there's a question. Um, we can tell you... Uh, we can tell you it's got a little bit of Alan Pope in it and some glow sticks. <laughs> the, the amount of guests we got in the show was quite good, and they all did awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, thought we, it came we, out quite well in that regard. Yeah, we had we had um, lots of people in, and it's I mean it's always nice when we do the show. You know, we've got full auditorium, and people come up afterwards and they say, "Wow, that show was really great," and everything. Because we um, there was a there was a bar laid on um, by Ticketmaster. Thank you very much for that. Had a few beers. Um, drank some drank some beer called Tecate, which I'd never heard of. Um, so you know, thanks. Didn't know you never had a Tecate previously. No, I'd never even heard of it. Blimey. Um, but they had Dos Equis and then they ran out of it. <laughs> so you know, sort of <laughs> might have just been me. But um, but it's nice when people come up afterwards and they say really enjoyed the show. Really, uh, and and people go away saying that they learned some stuff. Uh, in the past, we've been accused of poncing around a bit too much on stage or oh, uh, this is heritage from my lug radio days to be honest with you rather than bad voltage live but i like the mixture that we have of here is some serious stuff that you're expected to learn and here is something a bit less serious <laughs> and yes uh, and i feel like um i feel like the show the live show went really well in that regard it was cool what was your favorite bit Ooh, I, there was. I, I would agree with you. I thought the mix of having genuine experts on stage talking about current technologies that personally interest me quite a bit to uh, doing a, a comedy game show that I think came out pretty well, despite my initial. So I suggested once again, I won't give away too much, but I suggested one of my absolute favorite shows of all times got delayed on a plane. And then let two people, and I missed a planning ses session for the live show while that delay happened, uh, t to return to two people that have clearly never seen said show plan a, a alarming misrepresentation of said favorite show. And it actually ended up coming out quite well. So uh, all's well that ends well. 
I think, having read a two-line description of it in a TV guide and seen a picture in Google image search of how the game works, what we came up with was quite a good game show. I, I, in Jeremy's <laughs> defence, it is not the actual game show that's on television, but, you know. <laughs> but yes, it was good fun. Um, so, yeah, Bad Vultures Live went really well, but what did you think about the rest of Scale? Any particular highlights? Yeah, so for me, I think the highlight was uh, Mitchell Hashimoto's keynote. I think it's one of the better keynotes that I've seen in a while. He did uh, from the dorm room to the boardroom or something like that, which was really the story of how he founded uh, the company Hashimoto, which I think is, is an awesome company doing really great open source work, consoles everywhere, Terraforms everywhere. Um, this was really specifically about how he turned writing Vagrant while he was in college into the company that it is now. Just uh, uh, Mitchell is uh, is awesome, just so self-aware, so humble, uh, doing such great work. I, I, I think that for me was the, the highlight. Um, and then, as always with these kind of conferences, I think the hallway track was great. Got to catch up with a bunch of people that I hadn't seen in a while and had some great discussions around, you know, where open source is, where it's heading, some of the new licensing changes. We had some interesting conversations about about um I actually talked about about measure quite a bit and uh, you know observability and, and some other things there so uh, those I think were my my two highlights what about yourself yeah well um I mean I agree with you on the hallway track one of the the things that I like about going to a large conference like this especially in another country is it's full of people who I only get to see once a year or something like that or less often and so I get the chance to catch up and find out what's going on and that was really cool um uh, Steve Wally's talk, I mean, obviously I'm going to like Steve's talk because he's a friend of mine, but it was a really good talk, actually, and Wally's really yep. engaging, and one of the things I like about when he puts this stuff together is that he's a really big picture thinker. I, I mean, I've quoted um, Ben Thompson from Stratechery on the show a couple of times, and he's another one, someone who can um, take a step back and see individual decisions in the context of big picture strategic thinking. Yep. And and I, I find that really interesting because every now and again, you know, you get, you get a bit stuck and you can't see the wood for the trees sort of thing. But having um, having Wally explain the three different CEOs of Red Hat and how their different approaches have changed how the company worked and everything, I thought was fascinating stuff, you know. Yeah. And it had a picture of a bottle of tomato ketchup in it. Um, my other highlight was going into a dim sum restaurant and saying, yeah, we'll basically have one of all of these things and then about four times as much dim sum as we could possibly even carry arrived. <laughs> that was an alarming amount of dim sum. Although, it was very, very good. Very nice. Yes. No, two thumbs up to that. Well done, Pastina. Got a decent dim sum restaurant. But yeah, basically, scale is cool and we really enjoyed it. And yes, as Joey says, uh, thank you very much to the scale people and Ilan especially um, for... <laughs> allowing us to come and perform, especially since next door, America's Got Talent were firing um, a person out of a cannon. And he, and he, to be clear here, is not joking. They literally, one half hour before our show started, right as the doors for our show were opening, they closed the entire road in front of the Pasadena Convention Center and shot a man on fire out of a cannon. <laughs> they did. And people came to see us anyway, which just goes to show you, Simon Cowell. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, stay tuned for the live show being posted. I believe we're going to post it in lieu of the next sh scheduled show, but if that changes, we'll certainly let you know. So uh, without John, we're still going to go ahead and do a little bit of news now that we've wrapped up the scale slash bad voltage live intro. So, and now, bad voltage news. And I think that the first one that we're going to start with is we got a suggestion in the uh, forum, which is community.badvoltage.org, if you'd like to go participate, uh, specifically tagging me, so I'll, I'll kick this one off. And this was from a community member called Eric Schultz. So first, uh, thanks for the pointer. I did think it was interesting. And it was a pointer to uh, an article titled, The Hottest Chat App for Teens is... Google Docs. And uh, I, I kind of thought this was going to be an Onion article. It was not. It was an, an Atlantic article. And it actually is uh, kind of amusing because Google Docs is being used in a lot of classroom environments now, especially in high school. Uh, kids in the classes are cloning the doc, 
so that if the do, uh, teacher or TA or whatever comes by, it looks like what they're supposed to be working on. And then using the chat functionality, chat with each other. And they're actually cloning it multiple times with different groups so they can chat to different subsets sub of friends and like a lot of flirting and things that you would expect to go on in high school happening here. So uh, I think it's amusing to me for for two reasons, and, and I'll let you kind of give your take after that. Uh, <laughs> the fact that Google now has 11 or 12 chat apps, whatever it is, and teens are going to, flocking to Google Docs to chat is <laughs> a little bit amusing there. But I think the other thing is kids really will find a way. Always have, and I, I suspect always will. I think I mean, it's not just kids. I saw, and I went to look this up, and for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Matthew Paul Thomas who proposed... A corollary, I suppose you'd call it, to Zawinski's law. You know, Jamie Zawinski once said that every program grows until it can read mail, mm -hmm. which now sounds like a terribly quaint and antiquated thing to say. <laughs> um, but it was important in like 1995 when he said it. It was. Um, but I think it was MPT said that people will chat and have conversations anywhere. Uh, anywhere they have the space to do so, they will be, which is why you get people having completely unrelated conversations in blog comments on a particular blog post or something like that. Because people will just take the opportunity to chat wherever they can. Um, in, <laughs> um, you know, in, in Wikipedia talk pages or whatever. Anytime there's a chance for a conversation, people will take it. And this is a perfect example, because exactly as you say, um, um, if, your, if your parents have banned you from social media or your school blocks Facebook or Facebook Messenger or doesn't let you take your phone or blocks WhatsApp or whatever, but you've got Google Docs, then you're going to have a conversation in it. And then you couple that with the normal predilections of school kids to do this sort of thing anyway you know i mean in in our day it was passing actual physical notes from table to table it's, <laughs> right yes it's an awful lot easier if you can do it with google docs i'll say that i'll say that and the teacher can't seize it off you and read it out either which is good <laughs> but yeah i mean obviously people are going to do this the, the thing i like was the whole cloning the document thing because they're essentially yes. just creating chat rooms it's there's a yep. so, there's a sociology paper waiting to be written about people's desire to to organize and segregate their conversations and to separate them out and to, uh, and to allow some people in some people not in um uh and to enforce cliques and all this sort of thing and I, I say there's a sociology paper waiting to be written. I'm sure there have been 400 million sociology papers already written on this particular <laughs> yes. point that I haven't read. I presume um, you are correct there. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's just fascinating. The, the, the idea of attempting to stop people having this conversation is just completely pointless. And what they said, I'm reading through the article, which we'll link to in the show notes, um, uh, what, what most of them said was, honestly, it's not exciting conversation it's not all top secret weird stuff or um terribly exclusionary or so on Pe people are attempting to blow this up into a news story by saying ah oh, but what they're doing is they're using it to taunt and bully other children and honestly they're not one of them said um uh skylar and a, a pseudonymous um uh, yeah, team. everyone in the article was Skylar. Yeah, <laughs> quoted in the in the article says, um, people just talk shit about teachers. It'll be like talking about their days. It'll be the most boring stuff, but it's the only way to get any message across to each other. And that's the point. It's not some way of having top secret conversation. Just a way of having a conversation. Yeah, yeah. I thought I I thought it was fascinating. So, uh, the online version of Microsoft Word does the same thing and. Whatever you do, if you're going to allow people to collaborate on a machine, they're going to collaborate by having pointless conversations. I mean, we've gone on and on and on about Slack. Um, but it has a similar kind of a problem. You know, you put people in a Slack to do work and they'll talk about their day, which which is fine. If you didn't have Slack at all, people stand around the water cooler and talk about their day. People call them water cooler conversations, even though no one's had a water cooler for 15 years. <laughs> right. When did you last see a water cooler? I tell you, the last time I saw a water cooler was at scale. But the last time I saw one before, that was ages ago. <laughs> What's next on the list? Cool. So thanks again, Eric. And uh, yeah, what's your first news item? Right. Um... Uh, so, Beto O'Rourke, who is apparently one of the great Democratic hopes for president. This is the relatively young, good-looking guy who lost to Ted Cruz in Texas and is now running for president. Apparently, he was in the cult of the dead cow. Legendary hacking group from the 80s and 90s. 
It is so, such a legendary group. It, it was. I, I'm still not sure fully how to digest this one. <laughs> oh no! Even though that I've known about it for for a little while now, I, I genuinely don't know what to think of this. It is uh, obviously fascinating. He left pretty young, about 17. The a bunch of the articles I've seen keep mentioning that they did like back at Orifice and a bunch of things, which he would have been long gone by then. Yeah, long uh, gone by the time back at Orifice. So to, right. to 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 cue people in who don't understand this stuff entirely, um, the the CDC were at least to my awareness as a bloke in England, um, the first real named hacking group that were famous. I mean, you had. CDC, the Cult of the Dead Cow, you had the Loft, and, yep. and the Legion of Doom, I think. Um, oh, I forgot about the Legion of Doom, yeah. <laughs> and they were kind of the, the early, when, when there was some notoriety around this sort of thing. And that, and that sort of group being notorious, by the time people like me would have heard of them, they were largely out of the actual game and more into giving talks at places and stuff like that. Then all you started to go legit. When they were actually underground, I didn't right. hear about them because I was a guy in Bedfordshire who was 14 or something. And to give listeners an example, if you're not familiar with uh, CDC, we're talking the early 80s here in BBSs. We're not talking, you know, very modern. So it was, I, to, to, to my knowledge, you are correct. They were definitely one of the first, if not the first, and certainly one of the most famous first ones. Um, so fascinating to see that we now have a presidential candidate who was a member it would be, I have to say, I've not heard very much from him on digital policy, which is uh, uh, not because I haven't particularly gone looking, because whatever, you can thin out your field on presidential hopefuls before I start paying attention. But right. but one of the things that I tend to look at in political candidates is their stance <clears throat> on digital rights and digital privacy and so on and so forth. And it would be interesting to see what his platform is on this, because for almost as long as I can remember, people in our industry have been saying, well, if someone, if we, if we had a politician who understood the first thing about computers, rather than getting their secretary to print their emails out for them, maybe we'd have decent computer and tech policy in our country. Um, maybe this is a chance to have that happen. But it'd be interesting to see whether he really is on what we call our side, or whether his 17-year-old self would deplore the presidential candidate he's now become. Ah, uh, interesting. So, uh, the, you know, you mentioned that I, one of the things I did in preparing for the show was look, because I figured he would have a comprehensive digital um, statement or whatever it is. And from what I can tell, he doesn't have uh, well-stated, strong political views about this. He has some pretty strong views on business. You know, he's pretty centrist for, for a yeah. candidate these days, um, kind of, bordering on uh, libertarian and a, and a lot of his views uh, has gone uh, on the record and some bar bipartisanship things some like I said some business related things has pretty strong opinions on some crime and drugs but I could not find a strong statement on where he stood I, on a topic I like this I could I mean I, I did I did look I, I joke a bit about waiting for it to thin out but I couldn't see anything particularly obvious it's certainly not a large part of his platform right which in one of the early members of CDC, you would think that it would be, but um, I guess people think differently in there. He's got to be late 40s, early 50s if he's running for president, and when he was 17, leaving you know CDC. So um, definitely an interesting story, though, and the fact that it's even a, a, was an option that someone like that is now running for president, I think, is in a, a leading indicator of where we'll be in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> that. It will be fascinating. Yes. Okay. So, um, what's next? So I'm going to take this one, and I think a, a, a little out of character for me here. Two of these that, I, if we have time, I'll get to another one that I'm discussing. Started as kind of Twitter rants, which is a little atypical for me, but this one I thought was an interesting uh, confluence of a little bit funny and uh, pretty topical and, and interesting from a news perspective. And it is the one of the co-founders of NPM, which is the registry for um, node stuff says a major international bank accidentally published a private package of their own to the public MPM registry took over three years to notice and then sent DMCA takedown notices to Amazon and Cloudflare for hosting quote unquote stolen code. Now I have to pay a lawyer to explain this to them. And they actually followed up with some, some other tweets about how, um, 
they had to pay lawyers to make to explain why a React package did not constitute quote unquote stolen financial credentials and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, one, I'll say I, I'm sure you've used Node exponentially more than me, but uh, it is for someone like me who does not use it all the time alarmingly too easy to accidentally publish to the public registry. Why? If I mean, um, it, because if it's the default and you type in a username and password that doesn't exist, it creates a account account and publishes it, which is a weird default. Okay, that okay, that's slightly weird. But the the issue here is not people who have genuinely accidentally published something; they just pushed it to. Yes, they should care a little bit more about this, but publishing packages ought to be easy if they pushed their code to launchpad and it was a publicly visible repository and then they sued canonical for hosting stolen code or cloudflare for being the cdn for launchpad that would be exactly the same situation and it would still be stupid so the cloudflare thing is especially funny because it just <laughs> means they don't understand how the internet at all works but uh i i maybe i'm old school in my engineering practices and methodologies but i don't think at a bank you or any employee should even be allowed to publish code. Like, let your CI/CD system do that, which means it doesn't have to be that easy because you're never doing it. I, I, I don't, yeah, that's a reason why you, as the bank, if you want that to be your policy, should maybe block post requests to npm or something but that's not reason for npm to make it difficult for everybody just well i i think their their answer would be we sell a thing to fix this problem it's called npm enterprise by the thing but i mean i think at least more of a warning in yarn when you're publishing things would probably behoove them in the twitter back and forth one of the things they said is this happens all the time if it happens all the time it's probably an issue but i think it's funnier that even in this day and age and i guess to maybe be fair, three or three years ago is a little while ago in internet time. So maybe they uh, weren't quite as rigorous in their their methodologies as they are today. But three years ago, for a bank to be doing this, honestly, is not that long. Yeah, no, it, it isn't. And um, and they did actually say that the the package that was published, there was a readme in there about the proxy that that company had set up, which you had to connect to to publish to npm. So. <laughs> so i mean this 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 is the thing i mean yes i can see that um there's an argument that npm should make it more difficult to do this sort of thing but really i the, i mentioned steve wally earlier this is one of the things where he and i part company because i would much rather people were easily able to publish things rather than enforce a quality bar on it and yes that means you get swamped with a sea of not particularly useful packages and repositories with no licenses on them and you get accidents, yes. and you get accidents like this, and both of those two things are a problem. But the number of people I've seen turned away from development because it's such an insular, elitist world where everyone assumes you know what you're talking about, screw that. I'd much rather make it easier and then deal with the problems of easiness than make it harder and deal with the problems of hardness. I, I, I think I, I, there is obviously a balance to be. I was going to say I'm probably a centrist on this one that I prefer high quality documentation that makes very clear that nothing is elitist and that it is here are the steps to take, but that there were proper steps to ensure it, which is is probably a. Yeah, I mean, and obviously the pendulum's going to swing in one direction or another, and certainly npm represents a swing of the pendulum in the direction of let's be as free and easy, or let's be a lot freer and easier than other. Package. Let's the whole, one, the whole, one yeah. package and then the half of the internet will get downloaded and yeah. into your node app totally um node as node as a platform node and npm as a collective platform is a flag in the ground a statement in favor of that way of doing things where lots of people will include very small packages of dependencies and you have a lot of dependencies lots of people complain about it and they have a point and they're welcome to not use node to do that there are other things which don't work like that at all um, and don't have this policy of pulling everything from NPM and pulling a huge dependency tree. Just have, you know, one tight bundle of code that does what you want, and that's all it does, and you basically don't depend on anything, and you include, you vendor it all in or whatever. Um, but I think there's a lot of people who, what they want is they want, for instance, Node, but with the don't have lots of dependencies argument. And I think mm. Node itself is at least partially a statement in favor of we think this is the way to do things. And some other language is going to be a statement in another direction. 
It does make you laugh, though. <laughs> Half the problem here is this is... Um, the phrase major international bank summons up a kind of picture of what their IT department is like in my head. And that may be a completely unjust picture, but I don't think it is. <laughs> and, and this sort of thing is where the relatively freewheeling nature of modern development, modern internet development clashes with the way banks think which is uh, you know you if you do the freewheeling thing and then go oh no we've made a mistake sick the lawyers on them it's right. never going to end well uh, all right next right yeah the the other one was a tweet from youtube insider right and obviously you know um we've seen the uh news coming out of new zealand and it's terrible one of the one of the things we've talked about in the show a lot in the past, and one of the things that's becoming more and more part of public discourse is how and whether um, big social media networks are responsible for spread of this kind of news and the wrong the wrong sorts of angles on this kind of news. And YouTube, for the first time, I believe, have te- seemed to be taking a sort of a proactive PR stance on this. If nothing else, they they tweeted. Um, on the 18th, which was yesterday as we record this, so Monday the 18th of March, they tweeted, um, wanted to give an update on our actions since Friday's horrific tragedy. We've removed tens of thousands of videos and terminated hundreds of accounts created to promote or glorify the shooter. The volume of related videos uploaded to YouTube in the first 24 hours was unprecedented, both in scale and speed, at times as fast as a new upload every second. In response, we took the following steps automatically rejecting footage of the violence, temporarily suspending the ability to sort or filter searches by upload date, which limited the ability to discover and view violative content while our teams worked to remove it, and making sure searches on this event pulled up results from authoritative news sources like the New Zealand Herald or USA Today. There are a couple of reasons I think this is interesting. The, um, The first reason is that... Even given the fact that this is being tweeted by YouTube themselves, and therefore obviously it's going to put the best possible light on the work that they're doing, but this is exactly the sort of response that lots of people, me included, have been calling for, taking an actual human-driven stance, not just hiding behind the, oh, no, it's the algorithm, it's nothing to do with us, having people say, this is a problem, we're going to step in and fix it, we're going to stop people exploiting it, we're going to stop people making it worse. This is exactly what we've asked for, and... They're doing it. Good. <laughs> but um, but the other thing I thought was interesting is that they are prepared to not just attempt to find problematic content and remove it, but to fiddle with the interface as a whole to stop it showing up. Things like um, temporarily turning off the ability to filter searches by upload date so you can't see the stuff that's come up just now until they've had a chance to review it. Automatically rejecting footage of the violence is is an algorithmic thing, right? right. Uh, they they take whatever um, huge bank of computers they've got doing content on the idea on all my videos in case I have five seconds of a Guns N' Roses song, and teach it about um, videos of shooting and say look for these. That's fine. That's just algorithm stuff. But um, changing the interface by which people find YouTube things so individually. Uh, jiggering searches. So when people search for an event, they've manually said no. We want it to. We want to. We want to explicitly boost authoritative, proper news sources, rather than user-generated content. Right. I. I think. I think basically everything they've done, assuming every, what they've said they're doing is the truth, and I've got no reason to believe it isn't. I think everything they've done there is great. I can absolutely see someone saying half the reason you think it's great is because they're jiggering their searches in favour of stuff you agree with. And I don't really have an argument against that. Right. So I'm interested in your thoughts on the wider ramifications of them being prepared to do this. I'm I'm definitely pro this in theory. I think one of my concerns here is the making sure searches on this event pulled up results from authoritative news sources. I I don't know that we have a definition of authoritative news sources that everyone will agree on, and that's a little bit problematic, I think. Um, I would like to take this time out to tell you to go support journalism in all of its forms, because democracy really does die in darkness. Seriously, go support 
quality journalistic outlets, which is something I feel like I've been saying nonstop now. But um, I, I, how do we agree what's authoritative? How do we agree on what should be filtered and what shouldn't? Um, I, I think because the, the and and what's interesting to me here is I think my opinion is slowly starting to to change here compared to what it would have been even a year ago and certainly more than a year ago. Um, now that I think technology companies are the cr clear arbiter of information, how do we become as a as organizations individually, but as a field as a whole? Uh, how do we become good arbiters of that information? And that's a really difficult answer that I, I unfortunately, listener, don't have an answer to right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't have a solution here. I just it is problematic, of course, to let a company this large uh, control access. How you prevent that, I don't know. I think information is obviously freer now than it's ever been, and that's that's a good thing in a lot of ways. It's had some, I think, um, let's say, troublesome unintended consequences that I don't think any of us foresaw, at least not to the level that they've been problematic. So uh, this is definitely a learning experience for both the organizations and I think realistically for humanity as a whole, which is not a great answer, um, but I think is an honest one. I Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, mean, I, I think... Part of the way my thinking has changed on this stuff in the last 10 to 15 years is I used to think, I'm trying to think of a way of describing this, I, I used to feel like I, I had an opinion on what was right and I should stand for that opinion um, because I believed it to be the truth. Be prepared to listen to other people if they if they said I was wrong. Um, always take criticism. If you are wrong, then back down from it. You know, don't cling mm. to it, whatever. But... I'm increasingly also finding myself thinking if you've got an opinion you believe is right and you're lined up with a bunch of assholes who also believe it and nobody else, then even if you think it's right and you don't think it's right for the same reasons as them, maybe back off a little bit. Hmm. And I haven't fully thought this through. I, I'm honestly not sure what I believe about this, but... If you'd have asked me 10 years ago, I'd have called myself a, f a free speech absolutist. And I'd have said, yeah, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant and quoted all the standard arguments for this sort of thing. And I still do largely believe that that's the case. But if I ran into someone now and they said, I'm a free speech absolutist, I wouldn't think, wow, you are flying a flag for democracy, Voltaire. I think that's fantastic. I'd think, OK, you want the right to talk about appalling things on vote. And I don't really want to be associated with you. And and so this sort of thing where 10 years ago I would have said, I don't care that um, we're probably making the world better by stopping people uploading um, videos they think are hilarious of shootings. Um, which uh, It's terrible for YouTube, a huge corporation, to suppress the voice of the people. Now I think, you know what? Maybe it's actually okay. And yeah, there is a completely separate problem with the fact that we've made Google the arbiter of this, who are completely unelected and profit-driven. But it feels to me like they're doing the right thing and people standing up against it on free speech grounds mm. are perilously close to arguing in favour of being able to post these sorts of videos and then just shrugging their, you know, wringing their hands and going, oh, well, nothing we can do about it. That's free speech, eh? And right. I don't really want to find myself standing shoulder to shoulder with such people, even if I believe similar things that they do for different reasons. So, so I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know what I think about this, and it may be like the big question of our times. I, it, it's a big question of our time for sure, and I think it's interesting that both of our uh, opinions are kind of changing and, and evolving here. So two two comments here. One. Um, as previously said, community.badvoltage.org. I'm genuinely interested what some of the listeners think about this. I know it's a little bit of a hot button topic, so keep it respectful. Um, but this is something that I'm, I'm genuinely curious what, what other folks and, and what other listeners think. Um, two, quick question for you. Do you think that your opinion is changing because you, over the last X amount of time, let's say a few years, have had access to new information and that information didn't go as you thought and now your opinion is evolving as a reaction to that? Or do you think it is because as part of the aging process, your opinions are moving in a certain direction? 
I don't know. Um, I have... I have often thought about the fact that people tend to get more conservative as they get older. Uh, one of the one of the things that I think J.K. Galbraith said was a conservative is a man with something to lose. And the ambiguity of that remark is what makes it good, I think. Um, but <coughs> I I don't feel like I've become... Uh, boring, more boring and conservative as I've got older, even though my 20-year-old self would claim that is the case, I would claim that I have more understanding of nuance and less of a desire to pigeonhole things into A or B and no in-between. Um, but then that's what all old people say and no one who's 20 listens to them. <laughs> so I, it, it's hard to tell from inside <laughs> I, I I believe at any given point in my life I've been more confident that I've had the right answer than I had the day before today. Whether this is actually the truth or not is probably for St. Peter to decide on rather than me. <laughs> uh, uh, on that fine note, listener, we, w- we want your opinion. Uh, all right, next story. Yes, you go. So I, we've talked about Facebook uh, almost an alarming amount, and, and I said I wasn't going to talk about Facebook this episode, and, and then I think this is interesting and a little bit different than the previous Facebook privacy stuff that we've talked about, and it's Facebook backtracks after removing Warren ads calling for Facebook breakup. This is a political story. Uh, Warren, for those of you who aren't familiar with American pol- politics, is Elizabeth Warren, who is, uh, recently announced that she's running as a Democratic uh, nominee for the president. So what seems to have happened here is that she she posted an ad on Facebook um, calling for the breaks breakup not only of Facebook but basically of, of most fang sized tech, technology companies uh, and they took it down. I, I imagine you have opinions here. <laughs> um, well, uh, my obviously my immediate reaction um, when uh, we first uh, we, when, when um, we f- this first came up, um, having just read the headline is. Obviously, this is bullshit, and Facebook just do this sort of thing all the time. Everyone just expects it of them now. Yes, they've been caught. Yes, they'll give a non-apology apology. apology. Nothing has changed. We've heard this story about a million times. And then Jeremy said, no, it's not like that. Facebook didn't take down the ads because they were calling for Facebook's breakup. Correct? So... It's been super difficult to get actual facts here, but if you take the, their response on the surface of it, which I'm sure, you know, my opinion of, of this company is well known, but and others have strong opinions in both directions, uh, their their contention is we removed the ad because they violated our policies against the use of our corporate logo in the ad. In the interest of allowing robust debate, we are restoring the ad. So it seems to me, uh, my initial reaction here is almost that her campaign people knew the ad would get taken down because the it's obvious that you can't use a company's logo in an ad. I don't know of any company that allows that um, for for valid reasons there. And that the ad would then get taken down and they could make noise about it, which doesn't seem like the way I want political discourse to start these days. I think we're becoming you know, more and more divided and I would like to be less and less divided. And I, I don't know that... Uh, and and to be clear here, I'm not saying they did this. I have no information at all about this. It's very much a, <clears throat> excuse me, a very much a breaking story. So the amount of information we'll have when this show comes out on Thursday will probably be enough to answer the question. Unfortunately, we don't have access to that information when we're recording the show on Tuesday. But um, as it stands now, it, it almost looks deliberate to me, which would be a little bit disappointing. Well, see, um, again, when I first heard this, I'm like, okay, yeah, Facebook took down an ad critical of facebook because it included the facebook logo that's ridiculous and you'd think that someone at facebook would have the nous to realize how this would look even if they are technically legally in the right i mean to give you another example i don't know how far you'd push this it, 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 I, I i'm not a trademark lawyer and i have no intention of becoming a trademark lawyer but presumably when you say facebook you're meant to write tm after it or a little r in a circle right because it's a registered trademark um, and obviously there are rules about 
um, when you need to use the trademark mark to indicate that this is a registered mark of some kind. And I don't know whether that applies in an ad, especially if it's an ad saying, destroy Facebook. <laughs> Having you say, destroy Facebook, TM, would be a different message. But if Facebook had taken it down for that reason, rather than the logo, that would still have been just as stupid. In my opinion, the fact that it's a logo and logos are protected it sounds like a weaselly legal way to to well, find the way of shutting these things An down. algorithm found our logo. The ad was automatically disc, you know, unapproved. Um, once a manual person, once a person manually got to review it, of course, you know, like I said, I, both sides of this have uh, very much things to gain and very much things to lose. So it's going to be difficult to find out what the actual optics of it are. So um, w would the Wall Street Journal take a ad saying that journalism is terrible and that papers shouldn't exist? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Um, if they if they did, uh, well, sorry, if um, someone tried to place that ad and they refused to place that ad, and then when they were confronted on why didn't you take that ad? They said, "Oh, because they had the they were when they said the the words Wall Street Journal, it wasn't in the correct typeface. They would be a <laughs> laughing stock, and that's what sure. this is now. I mean, I'm quite prepared to believe that what happened was Facebook have built um, a complicated bit of image scanning software which just looks for protected images in it, and then not surprisingly put the Facebook logo in their list of protected images." Um, and so it was taken down by algorithm and then right. reposted by a human as soon as it came up. Um, I do also take your point that if they did this deliberately, no, if the campaign placed this ad deliberately, knowing or suspecting that that would happen in order that they could blow it up into a news story, it is simultaneously quite a clever act of politics and an absolutely deplorable act. <laughs> I mean, you never know. It could have been a junior person at the campaign that really didn't know. I mean, like I said, it's not knowable. I think the interesting thing, and I was kind of playing devil's advocate with my, my Wall Street Journal thing. I think the thing that journalism, let me word this correctly. The, the thing that I, I think um, legitimate journalistic outfits found out long ago is that there needs to be a very 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 specific wall between the journalists and the people selling the ads and they're completely unrelated they don't affect each other at all and, and that and that wall is not changeable it's not movable it's not scalable it's just it's a wall the yeah technology between industry between marketing and editorial yeah yeah correct uh, that's a line that i don't know that the technology industry has has really figured out yet now that they are arbiters of information so how we whether we we as an industry take that model carte blanche and, and say it's worked for that other industry or whether this industry tries to figure out something else i don't know but i, I think those are the kind of answers that a, a newer industry has to answer well if they want to survive and be sustainable long term well you see half the problem though is that if I were some appalling tech person looking to say that no, there shouldn't be a Chinese wall in between, I don't know if it should be called a Chinese wall, sorry, my apologies, just a wall between um, between marketing and editorial. Say, no, I don't think there should be. And someone says, but no, we need to take it wholesale from journalism. You go, well, journalism doesn't work. Look, they're all going bust. <laughs> and yes, journalists have learned this long term and, um, uh, and newspapers and news organisations have learned this over the long term. But that's because all the ones who survived have the long term view. They've been around for a century. Yeah. And, and this stuff is valuable over time. But that's not really the case if what you're focused on is the next quarter or um, the aqua hire that you'll go through a year from now. So... Yeah, I, I, half the problem with Facebook and other companies like them is that their reputation is so in the toilet now that it's just super easy to believe the worst. The Wall Street Journal yes. example you gave, if you, um, if someone wrote a thing saying I tried to place that in the Wall Street Journal saying that the Wall Street Journal does terrible journalism and they refused it, you'd be like, really? Did they? Okay, I'm a bit surprised by that. Maybe there's some backstory here. With this, and it was worth me reading further because there is more nuance to it, but mm. I found it very easy to just go, yeah, well, of course Facebook blocked an ad saying Facebook should be broken up because they're corrupt. 
Right? <laughs> it's, and it's just so easy. I almost think it should be broken up for their own good because no one believes anything good about them anymore. I, everybody still uses the blasted thing, but I don't know anyone who actually has a good word to say about it. Even habitual Facebook users. If you say to them, what do you think of Facebook? Everyone's kind of, I don't really like it, but... <laughs> and, and and this is concerning, right? But then, you know, this is more um, manufactured helplessness because there's clearly nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Yes. So... so do, you have, uh, do you have one more that you really like? We're coming up around 45 minutes. No, I mean, there is one thing where I'm interested in your opinion on this, um, but this is not a discussion for now. Um, this is something where I'm interested... Uh, it's too big a subject, and I don't know where to get started with it. Um, so we were asked about 5G. Now, this came up in our uh, predictions episode. Um, and Greg Lowe asked... Um, uh, asked about the rollout of 5G and what's happening and so on. And, and so I've been, uh, especially since it was mentioned in the predictions and so on, and before that, I'd be going away and doing some reading about it. And But I don't really have a a handle on this at all. So, and you, you're not only knowledgeable about this stuff, but you have a telecommunications background, at least partially. Um, d how would you summarise the state of 5G right, you know, now in three sentences and where should people start what should the angle that people take on this be in your opinion it's it's going to be great it's totally pointless as i say we talked about it a little bit in our prediction show but i'm i'm interested in your summary as of right now for where people should start looking where people I mean, should start I, thinking. honestly i don't have an enough information about most 5G implementations to have a have a super strong educated opinion, um, and this was not in the, the doc, the shared doc. I will <laughs> no, um, no. <laughs> or else I would have come a little more prepared. But I, I think that it's... The, the, the whole point here was that we, we're going to do actual preparation on this. This is this is right. pre prep in order that we can find out about it. One thing I would be interested to know is what people actually want to know about 5G, um, because I think you know from a from a technology perspective. It, it's just a marketing term, right? It's the, the next generation of, of what 5G will be. I think what telecommunication companies want you to think is interesting is that 5G will be ubiquitous and ultra fast in a way that it will allow your home broadband to be 5G and your phone and, and it will have a, a low um, power mode where I IoT devices can connect straight to the cloud and all kinds of things. So I think... Uh, the, the frequencies that they're using and the ubiquity that those frequencies will allow is the the big thing. Um, it's obviously inevitable that it will come. I think uh, <laughs> AT&T jumped the gun a little bit there by saying that the, they called this something goofy, like 5G and enhanced or something weird where it was really just 4G. Um, this this I, is like, um, what was it called? HD ready as opposed to HD compatible televisions. When they first started coming out with HD, and HD was 1920 by 1080. And people wanted to be able to say, we're doing HD televisions without actually doing HD televisions. So they'd write HD TV and then put HD compatible underneath it, and it was 720p. Right. And well, it's kind of like with 8K TVs. Like, there's 8K TVs available, but there's no 8K content, so I don't know what no. that actually means. <laughs> Like four extra K, would you even need it for? But yeah, um, so so that's the thing. I mean, um, and this is a partially a call out to the community again, right? What to you is interesting about this? Uh, is it is this just thing where we all just sit back in our chairs and wait for it, and then three years from now, I'll be almost unknowing buying a phone which happens to do five G and a laptop which happens to do five G. Or do I have to go through the whole thing where, where I spend a year saying to people, I've got an E on my phone. I think that's Edge. Is that 4G? I don't really know. It's, is HSDPA 4G? Is VSDPA 4G? Right. What I'm interested in is not, not just where we should be looking in order to research this properly, but what people want to know about it. Is it just marketing BS at the moment? And I mean, I think does as anyone we move care? to the millimeter wave frequency stuff, it's... That's not a marketing thing. Like the bands they're using are changing, and those bands have trade-offs. So, so they're much faster. They're much less congested. 
the frequency travels less far because of the, the frequency of the wave. Um, so that stuff, I mean, that's not marketing stuff. Those are knowable facts. A- actual physics. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, whether we want IoT devices talking directly to the cloud, I think, is a different conversation completely. Um, do I look forward to a home broadband wireless account where everything can be connected at, you know, whatever, 10 gigabytes a sec, 10 gigabits a second or whatever they choose? Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, and speaking purely for myself, I've had enough kids already, but other people might be less sanguine about this sort of thing. <laughs> it's, oh, blimey. But yes, um, so I, this is um, a setup for a future conversation. So I'm interested in people's opinions on this, where we should be going with it. Yes. So multiple reasons to head to community.badvoltage.org and let us know what you think. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yes, uh, as, we, as we said, the plan is that the next show that comes out will be the live show, all nicely edited, and there'll be video, and it'll be on archive.org and YouTube and all this kind of thing, so you'll be able to get it, and you can either watch it or listen to it, so on and so forth. Um, we'll keep you up to date on that. We may do it before that. We may not do it for the next show and do it outside the normal run. <laughs> um, the video takes a while of fettling to edit normally. So, um, so we shall see how it works out. And, and that is assuming that, um, that Mr. Bacon doesn't actually die first. Uh, we, you know, we hope he doesn't get well soon. Yes. Yeah, speedy, speedy recovery. Hopefully. Yeah. So because otherwise he's not gonna be able to edit the show and that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, I, I think that's a wrap, unless you have anything else to add. Nope, nope, I'm good. Um, are you speaking anywhere in the next couple of weeks? Uh, in the next couple of weeks? No, I do not believe that I am. Nope, neither nope. am I. Nope, not at all. So, I'm, I'm staying at home, hooray. So, after the brutal jet lag week, after coming yeah, back from that's... scale, I'm, uh, I'm quite enjoying staying at home, to be honest with you. Yes, yeah. so, so uh, th- uh, this has been Bad uh, Voltage uh, Episode 50. Thanks for listening.